Um, I'll be making brief uh, comments, and these are forward-looking statements among them. Um, our clinical development program is uh, using cell therapy, T-cell therapy, targeted for solid tumors. So till uh, the, the concept was initially developed by Professor Steve Rosenberg at NCI, and we have licensed rights to that particular technology in 2011. Since then, we have now, I've been at the job for about two years, and we have built a clinical development program which has four studies in there for metastatic melanoma, head and neck, cervical, and non-small cell lung cancer. In case of melanoma, we have uh, both a fast track and an orphan drug designation awarded for the product. In case of head and neck, we started our phase two study in um, 2017. We presented preliminary data as part of a round of financing in January of 2018. And our cervical study with LN145 is also ongoing. We started patient dosing in September of 2017 as well. We now have our study in non-small cell lung cancer active. Um, we haven't dosed any patients, but there are sites active. That's in our attempt of moving the product into earlier line patients in patients that are PD-1, PD-L1 naive. We have made great progress in manufacturing. Um, the process where we licensed the till manufacturing from Steve Rosenberg was a six week long manufacturing process. We now have trimmed it down to 22 days of manufacturing with a product which is cryopreserved. Um, it allows for a lot of patient flexibility in terms of dosing and certainly 22 days in manufacturing suites um, has reduced our cost of goods and operational cost. We have a number of collaborations um, for TIL, uh, both in terms of academic collaborators as well as industry collaborators. Um, academic collaborations have been used for combination trials, in specifically in metastatic melanoma with approved agents, as well as moving the product into earlier line. We also use academic collaborations to investigate our um, power of TIL in various new indications, such as our collaboration with MD Anderson. Um, we have a collaboration with Ohio State University and also MedImmune AstraZeneca where we are looking at non-small cell lung cancer in combination with Durvalumab as well as a single therapy as TIL itself. Um, our pipeline is shown here. These are studies that are visible right now in terms of company-sponsored ones. Our metastatic melanoma um, study was just increased in size to 85 patients. Um, this is a result of our cohort two being expanded to 60 patients instead of 30. Um, we are certainly trying to move that study into a potential negotiation point for registration uh, with the agency. Our cervical and head and neck studies are ongoing with 47 patients each. And non-small cell lung cancer, as I noted, is in collaboration with um, MedImmune. Uh, it's a TIL alone or TIL plus Durvalumab study design. Um, from a corporate perspective, our focus this year is going to stay, of course, on clinical and regulatory. We intend to engage the agency in third quarter 2018 to discuss our registration path for our metastatic melanoma indication and um, hopefully get an agreement on what would be acceptable to them from a registration perspective. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. Thanks, Maria. Um, I'll start with um, a, a broader question. Um, so previously, you were a manager at Acerta and Pharmacyclics, which were two of the more interesting cases of uh, value creation in the history of biotech. Um, and since joining um, Iovance in 2016, manufacturing times have been cut. Your clinical uh, pipeline has expanded. Uh, so there might be some parallels is what some investors are saying. So can you talk about what strategies and lessons you learned from those prior experiences that you're, you're applying now to iAvance? Yeah, thank you for, for a great question. Um, for me, it's always focus on registration and how to bring a product to market. Um, it v builds value for the product, it builds value for the patients and for the assets, certainly. And once you start building value, it may attract attention from potential partners, uh, either collaborations or M&A or other type of activities. And from my perspective, really, uh, success in drug development is twofold. Either you get your product approved and the patients would have access, the company starts selling the product as well as the investors can get some return on their investments and or partnerships, that's equally successful from my perspective. So focus on execution, how you're going to get your product approved um, from a regulatory perspective, as well as what is the best space from a clinical and commercial perspective for your product, which is sort of what we are doing here. 
And there's no shortcuts. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's tenacity and sort of, it's a grind. Drug development is a grind. So every day you have to come to work and try and move the needle one step closer. So there's no shortcut. That's, that's the bottom line. Great. And um, obviously you're an adoptive cell transfer company and CAR-T companies uh, sort of, uh, in terms of valuation, they, they've been sold for nine to 12 billion. Um, so what are the advantages of your approach relative to CAR-Ts and what's the evidence we've seen so far to, to support the advantage? Yeah, um, we have a slide actually in our, our corporate deck and I certainly made it very trim because I knew that the Q&A is very important here today. Um, CAR-Ts are basically targeting CD19, at least the successful ones that have been launched so far are targeting CD19. TIL by nature is very polyclonal. This is why we think it has uh, efficacy against solid tumor. The, the distribution of clones is somewhere around 300 to maybe up to 3,000 clones are present in each product of TIL. So why the, a big differentiator between the two of them is polyclonality of TIL, also because there's currently no genetic modification. The safety profile seems to be slightly different than products that are genetically modified. Not to say we are not interested in genetic modification, we certainly are. Uh, we have talked about potential selection of TILs, genetic modification, but this current product is non-genetically modified, and so it, it's an autologous, non-genetically modified product. It has a slightly different safety profile. Um, I think it's going to be difficult. I heard Adaptimmune discussion earlier today as well. I think it is going to be difficult to take a CAR-T um, targeting solid tumor unless you know exactly what specific mutation or neoantigen you're going to target. If you don't know what you're going to target, then a polyclonal approach may be better. Great. And, and for many of us, um, when we get back to the office, we have to go through AACR posters, and I understand you have some data there. Yes. Um, could you sort of preview all, all the work I'm going to have to do and, and tell me what uh, we, we can take from your releases? Yeah, certainly. Um, so let me step back for a second and just talk about our interest in research, and this aligns with what we are trying to do in our research part of the organization. Um, so since I started at, at, back then it was called Lion Biotech, um, we had an unmodified TIL product, again, the autologous non-modified product, and um, I felt that this is uh, suitable enough for development and we are pushing forth in our development program. But at the same time, we know that this product can certainly be modified further. It can be modified by selection of certain TILs, such as PD-1 positive cells. It can be a equilibrium of various TILs could be shifted um, through use of co-stimulants, such as 41BB or OX40, and that's the poster that is at AACR. And we certainly can go down the path of genetic modification of TIL. So as part of this spectrum of activities, we are looking at shifting the equilibrium using various co-stimulants. We are working with uh, BMS. Uh, we are looking at 41BB. We are looking at OX40. We have published before that we have triple cocktail, um, which is a combination of IL-2, 15, and 21, which also shifts the equilibrium of TILs all of which could add a benefit in the final product that we'd receive. It seems that most of them are increasing the till count as well as uh, shifting the equilibrium towards CD8 tills. So we are very much interested in that space and, and creating a product which is currently not too differentiated but slightly better maybe in its activity. Uh, since you mentioned Adaptimmune, um, which is another adoptive cell transfer company doing solid tumors potentially, and also they have a lot of data upcoming. So the question I asked in an earlier session is that in the coming year or two, if your data are positive, it'll attract a lot of attention and potentially um, attract competitors who are trying to repeat what you're doing. So what are the barriers to entry for TILs um, that you have in place for any potential com competitors? Um. So from a patient perspective, and I think that's an important one to put here, although I'm a drug developer, um, the more products, the better, frankly, because we don't always duplicate what we each other do. So if someone else wants to come into that market, that's a fine outcome from a patient perspective. Having said that, as a drug developer, we make sure we protect our IP and know-how. Um, and certainly we have done the same thing. We have a very extensive portfolio of IP that we have generated around our Generation 2 manufacturing product. Um, if all is granted, we will have protection out to 2038. We certainly have a lot of know-how that we have developed, particularly around this Generation 2 product. 
and we are getting a lot of interest even from academic institutions in adopting our process um, to try and make sure that if they're doing local till that they have the same process as we do. And at the end of the day, the purpose for a company is to have a central product, completely controlled, reproducible product that goes to all sites. There's a lot of variability between till product that has been manufactured um, as part of academic pursuit of tills. You're correct that other people are coming into this space and we are aware of that. Um, I, I think that number one, between our IP and know-how protection, we have quite a bit of uh, coverage for investors, for, for the company. Um, it also is very difficult in cell therapy landscape for anyone to come in and say that their product is identical to ours. In general, there's not enough assays right now to say if a product, a cell therapy product, is completely what's called a BE, bioequivalent, to someone else's product. This is not a small molecule or a protein that we can fairly easily characterize and say these two products are BE. This is precisely why when we produce our generation two product, um, we decided that we are going to use this, shift everything to Gen 2, and we didn't necessarily claim a BE because it's not easy to do. So the barrier to entry for cell therapy in general, particularly for a polyclonal product, is going to be high. Um, we also make sure that it is quite high by IP and know-how protection. And could you talk a little bit more about manufacturing as well as part of that? Um, you know, at this conference, more than almost any, <laughs> Uh, process defines the product, and so what, what are the major challenges that your company, iAvance, has overcome that others would have to as well? For manufacturing, you mean? Y yes, please. Um, I've been asked this question recently quite a bit, that what is your success rate? And our success rate has increased, for example, since six months ago. Six months ago, we had 90% success rate. Now we are looking at 95% success rate. Why? Because we have streamlined a lot of the operation. We have put very clear SOPs in place. And one of the mandates that we have had on our team, internal um, IOVANS team, was to produce a process which is extremely robust. And anyone who is at a CMO, any junior level entry person, could reproduce. So the process itself is very robust with clear SOPs. Having said that, if people don't have access to the SOPs, it would not be easy to repli replicate because they don't know what we are doing specifically. Um, so we continue process optimization and improvement. We are still in phase two. We have time to continue with process optimization. And those process optimizations have led us to get from 90% you know, success rate to 95%. And, and in terms of improving uh, even further, I mean, um, could you talk a little bit more about the future of TILS? Um, we, we've heard about potency improvements, uh, improvements in the equilibrium. Um, what about engineering of TILS or, or any other uh, new techn technological approaches that could Definitely. be applied? Um, let me step back for a second that we continue doing process optimization. For example, one of our uh, process optimization steps has been, can we even go shorter than 22 days? And the answer is yes. I think we have to decide whether we want to roll that out into process development, whether we think a 22-day manufacturing is too long or not. I don't think it is too long right now. We are not seeing any issues. Well, process optimization certainly continues, and there's a lot that we can do and we are doing with, with the process. Having said that, um, genetic modification is certainly interesting. Um, it's also interesting to be able to take a um, specific genetic modification, for example, PD-1 knockout, and put it into the gene, hard-code it into the gene, or consider even transient modification of cells. I'm going to call it epigenetics. It's not exactly epigenetics, but it's a transient modification of the cell. The cell may lose that modification over time, but that may not be a bad thing. That may sort of soft land the adverse event profile of the product. So we are very much interested in all the genetic modifications. There's a lot of new technologies and various ways of doing it. We're very interested in all of those as well as what I call epigenetic, although it's not per se methylation or uh, sort of that type of uh, genetic modification. It's more of a transient genetic modification. Great, and my final question um, has to be a quick one. Uh, what do you think investors are missing most from the iAvance story? I don't know. I think it's a, good, it's a good question, and I think we have actually very smart investors, and I, I would turn it around and I say um, investors have certainly picked up what they have been missing on Ayavan's story in the past you know, six months. I think our valuation certainly reflects that. When I joined the company, I think our market cap might have been around $250 million. I don't know what it is today, but we have been hovering around $1.2, $1.3 billion. So I'm very pleased with progress that has been made. I will take the onus to the company that we need to produce data. We need to show 
better manufacturing process. We need to engage the regulators and define the strategy. And, and I think that ultimately investor interest comes. But uh, it, again, as I said, there's no shortcuts. It's a grind. We just have to work at it and we have to gain investor trust and, and interest. Great. Thank you, Maria.